Base is dropped on a chilly but lovely Tuesday mornings. Tuesday thoughts here at Soccer Down here. April 16th, we'll be taking your thoughts on a number of different things that we get into today. These Tuesday and Thursday shows can kind of go all over the place. Um, I'm going to try to take this one into a different spot, but I want to do that by asking a question, John, to start with. Roger that. This is something that Um, I've been talking with different people in different ways about, you know, the whole MLS 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. When did one start? When did the other start? Um, Where are your breakdowns in it? Looking at attendance between your clubs that started in the original days and even 1998, the uh, Chicago Fire will add them into the originals and the clubs that came later and how there's just a total difference between them. I mean, it's it's a strong difference to the point that it's like, okay, wait a minute, how do we how do we deal with this? I keep coming back to identity, and and this can be something that is an on the field thing, and we talk about it a lot with like a New York Red Bulls team that presses, and maybe this year they're they're losing their identity a little bit. Talk about it with a New England team last week who is going to play vertical. You know, that's their identity. They're going to work hard and they're going to play vertical. How many clubs in MLS have an identity in your mind, whether it's an on the field thing or an off the field thing? When you think of the club, what do you think of? For me, I look at it more off the field first and then then I may go on the field when it comes to an identity and I, and I think that my why off the field gravitation hmm? why off the field first because you know and, and I guess for me it's still trying to learn the intricacies of the game and so, so as someone who has seen MLS from a casual perspective until about, you know, until three years ago, it's okay. What's going to draw me toward a particular team. And I I guess it goes from identity in the community and then on the field, it's to those individuals that they bring in to try to accentuate who they are. So, when I was casually watching MLS, it was looking at a Seattle and seeing how they fill the stands. It was looking at the LA Galaxy and seeing it, uh, the, uh, the the worldwide superstars that they bring in and, and how they're bringing in talent. For you know a team like Toronto, it was once again the the big name stars that they were bringing in. For uh, a DC United, for me, when, when you look at DC. I, it was the on the field stuff with uh, you know guys like Echeverry and and how that was an on the field identity for me. Um, and it's weird, literally, the I, way you're describing it, like I, I feel like it, it's a little bit of the issue that MLS has at times because it's the the surface stuff, not yeah. the the substance. I mean, yeah. let's let's talk about the Chicago Fire. So sure. we know they're going to move to Soldier Field. Um, don't know for sure, but it's all but said and done. That that's going to happen. It, we wonder why the attendance in Bridgeview has been so bad. Um, we've talked about the issues, you know, off the field with supporters groups. That's part of it, but you know, the supporters groups are not the majority of the fan base in, in any club. They're not. They're a huge driver of the fan base, but they're not the overwhelming majority of sheer numbers in the fan base so that's not the whole issue in chicago the biggest issue in chicago in my opinion you've had i think out of the last four years three of the worst seasons in franchise history period yeah when you're bad that's your identity 
People don't want to be associated with that. Right. I think the on the field product, and that's where the game has changed, and that's maybe the biggest change from MLS 1.0, year one, 1996, to MLS today, is that the on the field product drives everything. You can't fool people with smoke and mirrors anymore. No. You just can't. If Seattle is a bad team, attendance will drop some. Now, is it going to drop to Chicago numbers? No, because they have a bigger base to start from, because they've done a lot of the other things very well. But it's going to drop. That's sports. I mean, that's 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 how life goes. But yeah, it's economics. The on-the-field product is number one. And I don't know... Out of the on the field identities, if enough clubs have a strong identity, because I mean, let's let's look over at what's happening in Europe today. It's Champions League. The clubs that are at the upper echelon of the world in soccer have an identity. Now, some have better identities than others. Some have identities that maybe are not as defined in style of play. A club like Real Madrid, for example, and they're they're not playing in the Champions League quarterfinals because of this. Their identity has been to buy the best players in the world and put them on the field, flat out. Galacticos. You know you're going to see superstars. Are you going to necessarily sign a bunch of players that actually fit into a coherent system? Well, that, that's, that's a little underrated. You're going to sign the best guys you can possibly sign. It's worked to a degree. It absolutely has. It's worked in Champions League the last three years. Barcelona, we know their identity. We know the the whole you know ethos around the club. We know that you can go all the way back and, and draw lines to the Johan Cruyff days. You can, you can see where they've maybe deviated from that identity a little bit. Manchester City, they hired Pep Guardiola to establish an identity. Period. Liverpool. Liverpool's had, I think, the the best of both worlds, especially recently with Jurgen Klopp, in that they, they obviously have the off-the-field identity. You know all about who Liverpool is. But now they have an identifiable style of play. And players are being brought in to fit that style of play. How many clubs in the United States have that? And it's not fair to say, well, you have to be like Liverpool. Liverpool is is how many years old? Over 100. Goodness. Yeah, over 100. We know over 100. Atlanta United today is five years old. Today is the fifth anniversary of when Don Garber and Arthur Blank flew in a helicopter to land on top of Ventana's and come down and say, yes, it's official. Atlanta is joining Major League Soccer. Five years old. And I feel like Atlanta's done as good of a job as anybody in the league in creating an identity. Now, the on the field has had a few different faces to it. And and I think even in the Tata Martino days, you have to consider that there were different ways of playing. But generally, it's get forward, it's score goals, it's be exciting. The fan base, everything around it is part of that identity. They're further along than a lot of clubs in this league. And I feel like the clubs that are struggling, especially the 1.0 clubs, have either lost that identity or never truly established it beyond the surface. And we saw that this weekend in New England. What Outside of, okay, they want to get vertical on the field, they want guys who work hard. What else is there about New England? And that wasn't the case under Jay Heaps. You know, it was different a couple years ago. So... When you think of New England Revolution, what are the words that come to mind? What defines them? Bleh. Yeah. They're not good words. No. And that's that's an issue. That's a problem. Um, that needs to be addressed. You know, Chicago. It's been the same. It's been bad soccer lately. That's what you think of. LA Galaxy? Yes. Stars. On the crest, trophies, superstars, we get it. And attacking soccer. They've always been about entertaining. Got it. They've been one of the best of the 1.0 clubs. Sporting Kansas City. 
they have a, a definite identity. And what did they have to do to get there? They rebranded. They got away from the Wizards days. They got away from the Wiz days, for sure. They got away from that one fast. Mm-hmm. Lawsuits will do that to you. They got away from the Wizards days, and they rebranded as Sporting Kansas City. And they've also, alongside of that, been successful. They have an MLS Cup. They have U.S. Open Cups. They have an identifiable way of playing, and they have a, a person in Peter Vermes who is the heart and soul of that club. You know what you're getting when you get Sporting Kansas City. You know, let's look at some of the, the newer clubs. NYCFC. I don't know what their identity is anymore. No. Nope. You know, it started with David Villa, Frank Lampard, Andrea Pirlo superstars, the biggest of the big stars, names, bright lights, Broadway. Now, it's Alexandre Matricha, very good player. It's Bear, could be a good player. We haven't seen enough yet. Maxi Morales, very good player. Not superstars. Those names are not going to be on Broadway. And you're at Yankee Stadium to where... When you had the stars and the bright lights, people are going to show. If the results don't turn, people are not going to show. There's nothing to drive them there right now. That's a problem. I have, and this is just a very cursory blow through, I had eight plus who have identities okay. in the current in the current structure of of MLS, and it was four in each conference and a fifth that is developing an identity if the patience is going to be there with their new coach. Who are your ones with an identity right now in the West? In the West? LAFC? LAFC, um, bold, uh, in your face, um, Fast paced style, uh, commitment to excellence. You know, those are the things I think of when I think of LAFC. Seattle. Um, on the field, honestly, it, it's not the best defined identity, and, and it never no, and really that's... was under Siggy Schmidt. You know, it, it right. was. I mean, under Siggy, I think the. The most identifiable aspect would have been Obafemi Martins, Clint Dempsey up top, get it to them and let them figure it out. Right now, you know, it's probably uh, the excellence of Nicholas Ladero. It's, you know, Jordan Morris is the face of that team. Um, it's, I don't know. On the field, I don't really know how to define Seattle very well, but because of their success, they do have that identity of slow starter, gonna you know win trophies in the end, gonna compete at the end, gonna build up and be a tough team in the second half. Well, that's changed this year. They're one of the fastest starters. Other than that, I mean, just outside of the basics of the branding, you know, it's a big fan base. the The rave green, that's Seattle to me. And that's where I was leaning more than the on the field. Yeah, it's. It's one that if the on the field is not good, can it sustain itself? And I think it can for a while because it's so big. But has everything else established well enough? And I think the one thing that they're starting to do really well right now is invest in youth and invest in that next generation. And that will serve them very well going forward. We talked about Galaxy. We talked about Sporting. Yeah, Galaxy, the names, the stars, the Hollywood, uh, sporting, the 433, Peter Vermes, everything around the sporting identity. Yep, I think those two are in good good shape. FCD? Yeah, I, they have a very defined identity. And it, I mean, it goes back to when Oscar Pereja was brought in as the, honestly, as the academy director under Shellis Heinemann. And then when he came back as the first team manager, it just took another step. And now under Luchi Gonzalez, it's taken another step. It is commitment to youth. It's commitment to developing talent. It's a very, you know, homegrown, homespun type of thing. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, they absolutely have that. Now, is that enough to draw fans? It, it hasn't been so far. But if no. that combined with championships, maybe it can. And then there were two below the current bar that I looked at, and I was kind of like, there are some if-thens. Okay. And it was RSL and the earthquakes under Almeida. Hmm. RSL, on the field, I mean, really, it's it's developing young players. I mean, that's right. that's where I'm at right now. And it's it's been a change from the... RSL glory days of winning MLS Cup, competing in another one, getting to the finals of CONCACAF uh, under Jason Christ, where you had the diamond, you had, you know, uh, you had Morales, you had Beckerman, you had Ramondo. Now, you still have Ramondo and Beckerman, and they they give you some of that identity because of their longevity. And that, that does factor into identity. But when they're gone, what is the identity? Right now, I mean, Mike Petke is such a, a large figure, such a big personality that he helps define your identity a little bit. Um, you're abrasive. You're, you've got that in-your-face mentality. Albert Rusnak fits into that. You know, he's an in-your-face kind of guy. Uh, Crylock, absolutely. So aggressive in-your-face. Um, you have a, a, a very good fan base in Salt Lake City. You know, it, Salt Lake City and, and Real Salt Lake is one of those that if it's a random night and they're playing, I'm going to check in and see what's going on. I'm going to pull that one up. I'm intrigued enough to see what's happening with, with Real Salt Lake. And maybe it's just down to Petke. Maybe, honestly, right now it's just down to, man, I want to see what he's going to do. Yeah. That's a starting point. Um, they've had identity. They've kind of lost their identity a little bit. Not completely, but a little bit. And they've added some pieces to it. The The youth development is a big new thing for Real Salt Lake that I think they can lead the way on. And for me, that's why, because the wheels have fallen off early in the season in Portland, I didn't include them in this because you could go down the same road as Seattle with all of the history and all of the you know sellouts and all that kind of stuff, but I'm leaving Portland off the list temporarily because they're 05 and one. Well, see, no, I disagree though. That's the whole point about identity is, is Portland's fine because they have an identity, you know, they have the, the Portland green. I mean, that's, that's part of it. The fan base Timbers army are a gigantic part of that identity. Uh, the stadium is a big part of that identity. The on the field under Giovanni Savarese, um, they're gonna they're gonna be better defensively than they've been so far this year. That's part of the identity you would expect. Um, the on the field has been evolving because of the change from Porter to Savarese. but Diego Valeri is a constant. You know, uh, Diego Chara is a constant. You do have some pieces, so I would say they absolutely have an identity. I think when you when you think of Portland, some obvious things come to mind. That's the difference, and that's the thing. And that, okay, and then you take Houston as the the opposite example. Houston's winning games, but I don't think they have a real identity. Nope. Portland is losing games, but they absolutely have an identity. Identity transcends results. Houston, part of their struggles at the stand in the in the stands for attendance are that identity, and some of it's unfair. The work Wilmer Cabrera has done has been excellent. Albert Ellis is a player that you should be going to see. Mauro Minotas, Memo Rodriguez, Tomas Martinez, they have talent. So, you know, for me, Houston attacking, Latin, Central American specifically, you know, for in the, the largest cases with a guy like Ellis. Um, scrappy, I, I would put that on Houston. Um, but... You know, the orange, yeah, it helps. I mean, it's it's very identifiable in this league, but I think for a lot of people, the identity of the Houston Dynamo is still boring Dominic Kinnear at the end of his run when guys got yeah, old. Owen Coyle. And even more boring Owen Coyle. And it shows to me the, the hard challenges of when you lose that identity or you've never had it, even just winning doesn't change everything immediately 
So those two I would absolutely put as, as two sides of the coin. Portland has an identity. You know who Portland is, even when they're not winning right now. Houston should have an identity, but they've got so much baggage that I don't know if it's fully taken hold yet. That's the challenge. Minnesota, I think we're starting to see what their identity is now that they're in their own building. Um, now that they've invested in talent, I think they're still forming it, and that's okay. They're young. That makes sense. San Jose, they're redefining it with Matias Almeida because he's bringing such a style in that will be the identity. Like It's so bold and it's so different that it is going to be the identity of who the San Jose Earthquakes are. Vancouver, we're waiting to see what Mark Dos Santos you know, creates that identity as because I don't think Carl Robinson did anything to create an identity. I don't know who the Vancouver Whitecaps are. I have no idea what no. they're about right now. I don't know what they stand for. Um, Colorado, I, I don't know either. Um, you know, they, they tried with the, the English guys from the championship. Um, they tried with, you know, the, the New Zealands. They, they tried with guys that really weren't successful in this league before. And now they've changed it a little bit to try with MLS veterans. It's still just not really there. So, That's the West. We'll take a break. We'll look at the East. We'll talk about identity. Love to hear your thoughts out there listening, um, whether live or later on the podcast edition. Tweet at us at Soccer Down Here. Let us know who you think has an identity, who doesn't have an identity, how you define it, and you know what what type of an of an effect the identity of the different clubs has in Major League Soccer. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back. Soccer Down Here, Tuesday Thoughts Edition. Sometimes deep thoughts, brought to you by Jack Handy. Sometimes not. This one is deep identity thoughts. in Major League Soccer. What? Uh, who has identity? Who doesn't? Um, what is it? How do you define it? Because I think everybody looks at it differently. Sometimes it's the off the field. Sometimes it's the on the field. Sometimes it's both. But I feel like the clubs that have it are in a much better position than the ones that don't. Um, We went through the West, and John, you said you had about the same in the East with a handful of clubs who have established an identity, others who might be in the building blocks of it, and others who don't have it. What's your your take on the East? Right. Uh, Let me, before we go into the East, Jared said he was, he's not convinced that Mark DeSantos didn't underestimate how much work he was going to have to turn over in Vancouver. He he might've known that. I mean, I don't, I don't know if he, his mind has been blown by this at this point, but um, Yeah. I mean, there was a, a lot of issues in Vancouver, period. Um, the 
last season, the exit interview process sounded quite interesting with the media, where lots of players had things to say. And quite a few of them are not there anymore. So there is a bit of starting from scratch, but there's just a flatness about Vancouver. Like, yeah. And it's, it's even more glaring because of the Cascadia rivalries with Seattle and Portland, who you know who they are. You, you see Seattle, you're like, ooh, okay. You see Portland, ooh, okay. Vancouver, it's like, eh, what? I don't know. That's not a good situation to be in. It's harder because of the comparison. All right, to the east, obviously Atlanta, because you know we've talked about it and we've lived it for five years. Happy well, birthday! Okay, how would you define it? Um, I mean, I, it, it is both on the field and off. I mean, we all know the off the field and the openness, togetherness, the you know the the everyone working as one regardless of level of knowledge about the sport. There's always that uh, everyone willing to support one another and build each other up when it comes to what you're seeing in front of you, whether you have well, that's a fan tremendous base. amount of, yeah, yeah, that's fan base. I'm saying that's, that, okay. that's off the field on the field. I go back to uh, one of our old quotes, vertically dot. And that was what we were used to seeing. I know that obviously this year, Frank DeBoer has some ideas, and then once they come to the fore, it will be an exciting brand of soccer. But you want it to be exciting. You want it to be pleasing to the eye. You want you want scoring, and, and you want solid defense to go along with that. So I've thought that Atlanta United has had that identity. On the field, um, championships, I mean, I think that's yep. the, the number one goal of this club and, and one of the, the pieces of the identity. I don't think it's tied to any specific – tactical plan because Tata Martino evolved his uh, Frank DeBoer is is different not completely different but there are differences so tactically I don't I don't think there's one specific thing so far and again you're three years in three seasons in so it's uh that's okay that's fine I think it's it's excellence striving for excellence it's striving for championships it is a commitment to bringing in young exciting talent um the off the field to me it's not just fan base i mean this club has been you know very involved in the community um agreed i, I don't even know if i'd go the verticale dot on the field because that went away a little bit in 2018 versus 2017 um, this year, it's definitely not as much of part of the picture, but it's still there. So, like New England, that's how they play. That's the only way they play. It's just bomb it forward and, and fight for it. That's it. You, if you try to connect a pass in your own half, like you're going to get yelled at. That's not the situation for Atlanta. So, um, I go back to probably the pioneering spirit that that Darius yeah. talked about from day one. Um, that's something that has been true for this club from the beginning. And I think just looking big, just it's just trying to be big, just expecting to be big, whether that's, you know, lifting t- trophies, whether that's, you know, breaking transfer records, both incoming and outgoing, you know, just being big. I think that's part of the identity for Atlanta United. And I think for the newer teams, they've probably done as, as good of a job as anybody in creating an identity quickly. Who else in the East for you? Red Bulls. Yeah, um, on the field for sure. I mean, the, yep. the pressing style, absolutely. Uh, developing talent, absolutely. Um, I think your issues on the field right now are the the differences in your style that that's causing a little bit of the friction because you're trying to add elements to it. And are you are you adding elements to something and keeping what you have, or are you taking away from what you have to add something new? It's not what you want to do. So we'll have to see how Chris Armas balances that out. But Tyler Adams, his progression is a prime example of the identity of the Red Bulls. Uh, what's weird is they've had that. They have a very clear way of thinking. They have a very clear way of, of building a club, building a team, building a squad. They've done it for a while. They've had success with supporter shields, but it hasn't translated into attendance. And that's something that, that needs to be thought about. You know, well, is it is it the style of play that's turning people off? I don't think so. I mean, it's it's an entertaining style to watch. Um, 
they're winning with it. They haven't won the big trophy, and you know sometimes you do see that fatigue. I think Atlanta Braves fans can tell you about that from winning division titles, but then not selling out playoff series because you get that fatigue of, yeah, we're good, but we're not that good. We're not great. We're not winning the ultimate prize. Is that part of it with New York? You've seen a drop this year. It could be. It could be, and we'll see what they do to change that. And since you mentioned the word development, that was why I included Philadelphia. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't think it gets talked about enough, but um, Philadelphia's commitment to their academy and developing young talent and having a, a high school component to their academy and, and everything they do about developing talent, yeah, I mean, that gives them an identity for sure. It's That's something that's great, but they haven't had the success with development like Dallas has had. And Dallas hasn't had the ultimate success with it either. Both of them are, are having struggles at the gate at times. It's where it comes back to where the on-the-field product is important. Now, you know, it's, it's nice for it to be, you know, catch, eye-catching and appealing to watch. But ultimately, you know, why do we watch sports? You want to see, you want to see people win. You want to see your team win. And you can ride it out for a while that, well, it was a good loss. And, yeah, we're doing really well. Oh, yeah, we're developing these guys locally. That's great. I like it. But you want to see winners. And Philadelphia hasn't really done that in its history yet. You're getting to a point where it's kind of that tipping point, it feels like. And then the other one that I included was Toronto with an identity. But it's because of wanting to be the big dog in Canada. Therefore, you're spending on high-priced talent and winning trophies. And that was what I was looking at for Toronto and why I included them. Well, Toronto, from day one, had an identity because of the fan base. And that fan base, to me, is what took MLS from 1.0 to 2.0 in this type of conversation because they brought a different vibe completely to the table than what the league had had. That's important. Um, Toronto on the field, yes, in their last few years, being all about signing players for Big money, big salary. Chivinko, Bradley, Altador, signing guys to win trophies, 100%. Um, they they want to win everything they can win. And if that, I mean, that's a absolutely identifiable part of your identity. You know, Atlanta has that. I think the Galaxy have that. That it's just about winning. It, it's about spending whatever it takes to win. And Toronto 100% has that. And you combine it with the fan base and the style of the fan base, 100%. They have a, a very clear identity. And then the ones that I didn't quite think had one or were developing one, and this is kind of lumping two into one category, we talked about the Revs, we talked about NYCFC, and we talked about Chicago. FC Cincinnati, yeah. for me, gets a, a grade of incomplete. Well, they're further along than that because they do have that, that fan base that gives them something to start from. Um, on the field, yeah. I mean, it's, it's way too early. But they do have that fan base that gives them something to start with. And that's, that's something. That is, that is absolutely something. I think when they get into their own stadium, then you'll see a little more of a true definition of what FC Cincinnati is all about. And once the on-the-field identity comes together a little bit more, I think we'll see that. But they have a great starting point. Orlando City? No idea. Well, no, but that, that it's actually good to combine the two because FC Cincinnati and Orlando City kind of started from similar places. They have a great fan base. They're coming out of USL, so they have some years behind them. They, they both had that at day one. Orlando, year one, pretty similar to Cincinnati, year one. Scrappy on the field. You had Kaka, which was a difference. Cincinnati doesn't have that type of figure. But Orlando had that fan base day one. They haven't progressed from there. And that's what Cincinnati has to look at. That's what Sacramento, St. Louis, Nashville, Miami, everybody has to look at. Is Okay, you can create the buzz. You can create the excitement. You can bring that fan base into the league. All that's good. There has to be a next step. Because Orlando has felt like it's been treading water since day one. And on the field, it's gotten worse. 
in the stands, it's gotten worse. I understand it. If, if you're an Orlando City fan, you're frustrated and you question why I'm going to go to every game because it's been a lot of the same, I totally get it. That's the fear if you're you know a new team coming in and you do everything right off the field. Then get the identity, get the marketing, get the branding. But the on the field doesn't match it. That's an issue. And New York City, I think, is starting to go through that now because they never turned that corner completely. They, they went around the bend a little bit further than Orlando did, but they haven't completely made it around the corner, whereas Orlando never even got to the turn. Montreal? I don't know. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, Montreal's interesting because, I mean, they have elements of an identity for sure off the field. I mean, it, it's, it sounds silly, but just the, the city, the fan base, the – the French language, you know, it, they, they stand out. They, they have some uniqueness about them. Um, Nacho Piatti and his excellence gives them a focal point, and that helps. I'm going to peek in to see what's going on in Montreal because of Nacho Piatti. Now, when he's not there, then that's a problem because what are they about? I don't know. Um, that's been a long-running issue for Joey Saputo because this is a, a, a team that came in in – a similar way to Cincinnati and Orlando history. You had it, the impact go back to the old a league. Um, you, you go back to those days, you have a fan base, you have a passionate fan base. You have kind of a very European feel with Stad Saputo, but the on the field again, it hasn't matched it. Is there fatigue in the fan base because of that? Maybe a little bit. I think Montreal's done a pretty good job of riding through it. And I mean, they were an Eastern conference finalist in 2016, so it's not too far back to be pretty close. They they had the the long conquer calf run right before that. I worry about Montreal when Nacho Piatti's day is done. Because right now he's the identity. And when it's tied to one player, it's a problem when they go. Columbus, I look at the fans and I look at more of the off the field stuff than I do the on the field stuff. Yeah, Columbus Both good and bad. on the field had an identity under Greg Berhalter. You know, we have to give it a little bit of time to see what it looks like under Caleb Porter, how different it looks. You know, you had success under Greg Berhalter. You had a, a scrappy underdog team um, that played nice soccer, that wanted to possess the ball and wanted to get forward in a very coherent way. Um, Federico Higuain gives you some of that identity on the field. I think Jossie Zardes is becoming a big part of that identity now. You had the whole save the crew movement. I think they are in a position where they can be like a sport in Kansas City and kind of redefine who they are with new ownership, with a new stadium downtown. They don't have to go to the full rebrand. I don't think that would be the way to go at all. But they can redefine who the Columbus crew are over the next couple of years. They have that opportunity now, and I want to see where they go with it. And then obviously that leaves us with DC, and DC has the early history. And How long does now that, that you early have history hold up though. Uh, not. It doesn't. Um, have. The people no. in the stands now. I mean, you have the hardcores, yes, who who have been there from day one. They're there. You have the kids who have grown up on it. They're there. But how many of them are going to tell you about the days of Marco Echeverri and Jaime Moreno? Not as many as you think. That's why they signed Wayne Rooney. But again, it's it's like we talked about with Montreal and other clubs. When your identity is tied to one player, what happens when that player goes? Now, D.C. is in a new stadium. That's a big change in their identity. That's an opportunity. I don't know how well they've taken full advantage of it. They have been a lot better on the field since moving into Audi Field. Wayne Rooney's been a big part of that. How do they continue to evolve the identity? You definitely, like, that's one that you don't need to rebrand. You don't need to do anything like that. You you have something to work with. You have a lot of things that can be valuable in who DC United are. But on the field, Ben Olsen is part of that, too. I mean, he's been there almost from day one, whether it's as a player or as a manager. So he's a big part of it. But can he win you MLS Cup? Can can this group win MLS Cup? Can you get back to that? Because that's the difference. If you're a if you're a DC United and you go on a run this year and you win MLS Cup, what's your what's your storylines? Return to excellence. The glory days are back. 
because you can call back to all of those titles. You can have, you know, before the, if you host the final, you can have Jaime Moreno bring out one of the trophies. You can have Marco Echeverri bring out one of the trophies. You can have John Harks bring out one of the trophies. You have that history that not many clubs in this league have. That's incredibly important. And when you get back to that, it's like a jolt. It's it's a jump start. But can they get there? And we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Um, I'm intrigued to see what DC United turns into. Because they were one of the glamour clubs in day one. They did it differently than the Galaxy did. But they were right there. They, they spent money. Then they got away from that. And they became a very you know cheap club. Because they were paying so much money to play at RFK. And it was just throwing money away. While they were trying to get their own stadium done. Now they have their stadium. Now they're spending money on guys like Wayne Rooney. How do you redefine from being glamour to cheap to what are you now? It's it's a work in pro- process. It's a work in progress, and I don't know what it's going to end up being for DC. I'm I'm curious to see if they're going to go more in the Wayne Rooney superstar direction, or if they're going to go more in the Lucas Rodriguez, Luciano Acosta, young South American direction, or if they're going to develop their own talent. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to be when they go forward, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, but they have an opportunity right now for sure. Chandler Creel this morning on his Tuesday thoughts, he says, having a team identity is clutch for a team's success, especially in regards to fan support. One of the best examples was the Braves in the 90s. Visible owner and Ted Turner nationally broadcast on TBS formula for America's team. Yeah, 100%. Um, it, it became big. And, and you also, like the early days of the Braves, you know, success, you had a lot of young talent. All the young talent. You had a Terry Pendleton come in and be that that veteran leader, Sid Bream, veteran leader. But you had the pitching, and that was a big part of the on the field definition of who the Braves were. You know, Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, Steve Avery. You had the, you had a clearly defined idea of who they were, and then later that identity became the team that can win the division but can't win the big one, and that did become part of the identity, and that was a drag on it. Now I think you've gotten back to it's a young, exciting team, young talent, emerging talent, and it's a fun team to watch. So it's interesting. Like Some of these things when you, and the Braves I think are a good example of that, when you have an identity that is, is very well established in the past, when you can hearken back to that and bring that back, it's a jump start. You have, you have a, a better place to start from. And that's something like a, like DC, I think, is a prime example of that. If DC wins another trophy, they win an MLS Cup, instantly, you're a big deal again in your market. Right now, I think people, are, it's an afterthought. It's not as much of an afterthought because of Wayne Rooney. It's still a bit of an afterthought because everything's tied to him. You win a trophy and you call back to that old history. I think it's a little different. It's going to be interesting. Um, love to hear more of your thoughts, and we'll get into them as we go this morning. Want to talk some NWSL as well, kind of next steps for that league. Uh, some great stuff from our buddy Mitch Northam over at Pro Soccer USA. But we're going to take a quick break right now. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. 
Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Tuesday Thoughts edition of Soccer Down here. We'll get into the, the Twitter comments in this segment. I think we've not decided because we don't get to decide it. Uh, identity is a thing that's kind of hard for anybody to truly decide. But the on-the-field component can define an identity, especially if it's a winning on-the-field component. Um, or losing. But no, no, that that's from the outside. No, that's bad. Like, let's let's talk from a positive standpoint because, yeah, I mean, it's easy to negatives easy, positives hard. It's easy to write a sad song. It's hard to write a happy song. So, okay, yeah, losing can define it too. But if you want to be successful, you can put a good team on the field and get people in the stands and start from there as as part of creating an identity. Absolutely. I don't think you can purely create an identity off the field. Uh, I, I just I don't think you can and be successful. At some point, there has to be success. Orlando, I think, is a prime example. NYC is a prime example. I think the Red Bulls are an example of that too. Like the on the you have to win. <laughs> you flat out have to win, and that's maybe the biggest difference in the United States as opposed to to other countries. You have teams in England, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, every league that have an identity and have a passionate fan base that's not going anywhere. But they know they're never going to win anything. They're never going to win anything. They know that. Here, I, I think the winning element is a huge part of it. And because you don't have those generations of history supporting a club yet. You know, who's who's a prime example in England of a, a well supported club that has no chance of winning anything? They can be a yo yo back and forth Premier League championship team, but somebody who is just incredibly successful, has an identity, has a brand, but they they're never gonna win. Well, see, cause I mean I was you look like maybe an Everton who's uh, like one, one of the best of the mind. One of the best of the rest, I guess. You look yeah. outside the top six. They're not even going to get that, that buzz of getting relegated and winning the championship. Like, that's a buzz. It, it's it's not the greatest buzz, but, you know, a, a Norwich can get that. Yeah. Norwich, Norwich. is going to get relegated sometimes, and they're going to win the championship. And, yeah, we won, we won the championship. It's good. And we're back in, and now we're going to get beat up again. Everton doesn't even have that. Everton will be, what, between 6th and 14th. Yeah. On a pre, I mean, pretty much lock it in, and that's who they are. Maybe Watford. FA Cup run. I, Wofford's going to get that that championship buzz occasionally, but Everton's not going to like. They're not going to go away. They're they're established. They are who they are. Here, I don't think that's enough, and, and maybe it's just because in our other sports you have some dynasties, but you also have more. Years where you have a Leicester pop through and win. That just yeah, that was the one time. <laughs> like that was the one time that and Blackburn winning in what ninety five. Yeah, that's that's your your two outliers. Here, I mean, you can look at outliers in in every league. Now you do have your eras where you have Golden State right now. You had the Lakers. You had the Bulls. You know, you've had the Spurs. You're starting to get some teams that it's hard for them to shake that off, that just we're not going to win mentality, and I think they're the ones that struggle. Other sports, it's the same way. But 
to me, the winning, the on the field, the competing for championships, you can base an identity off of that. You can't strictly base an identity off of the branding, off of everything away from the field. I think that gets fleeting over time. And Orlando's a prime example of that for me. Um, I understand their fan base's frustration. That's not what they were presented at the beginning. And I don't know how close they are to that changing. I get it. Then let me ask you this. Okay. Obviously, the history in countries on other continents lends itself to the fan base being ever loving, never leaving that way. Vanderbilt football. And for me, I I think a lot of it in, at least domestically, in the last, say, 15 to 20 years, has wrapped itself around television contract and disposable income. These days, when you have a family of four, say, and you're going to go to a sporting event, it is a major investment. And if you're not going to get that value for your entertainment dollar that you're anticipating, you're not going to go back repeatedly. You're not going to invest everything you have in something. You're not going to get season tickets for a family of four or a family of five because if a team is mediocre or if they're awful, there's no there there. Your return on investment is so low, you can spend it on other things. And when you have television contracts that sit there and broadcast basically everything, even in the postseason, and you're trying to figure out where your disposable income is and where you're going to spend your dollar – If everything's on TV and you're a fan of a team and that game's on television, you're going to hedge your bet. You're not going to buy a ticket to a a game in the wild card run if you're an Atlanta Braves fan and you're just a casual fan and you're not a season ticket holder. Because, A, you can have a bunch of friends at home watching it and you can just go ahead and say, yeah, I'll wait for the division series or I'll wait for the championship series. Disagree. Disagree on this point. Right okay. now, they would. Last year, they did. Last year, people bought tickets. In 2001, 2, 3, where you'd been there, done that, been there, done that, been there, done that, 100%. And that was why you didn't have it packed out. But you had those down years to where people were hungry for it. Because they, they did great with attendance last year. Just because it's new and shiny and you have but all these new saying. players and... Yeah. No, 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 because the the playoffs, people went because they hadn't been there in a while. You had the the one wild card game where it was the worst uh, infield fly rule call I've ever seen in my life, and people yes. borderline rioted. Um, you had that, but that was it. Like, you had the, the series against the Giants, I think Bobby Cox's last year. Okay, that did, that did all right. But you didn't have a team that you thought, well, hey, these guys might be able to put something together. Last year you did, and last year it was great. So, like, if you keep if you keep getting there and keep getting keep stubbing your toe, yeah, people will decide not to spend the money. But when it's new and exciting, yeah, you're, people are going to go do it. Absolutely, because you want to be in on the, that, that new thing. Though. Yeah, more distinctions, more talk. Uh, Shiva's got some thoughts too. We'll get to those after a quick break to wrap up hour number one. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. 
There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Final segment, hour number one. Talking identity around Major League Soccer. Uh, Shiva says this. Atlanta's identity, in my opinion, off the field, a club that brings the city together through the beautiful game. On the field, excellent fan experience through an exciting product. The goal for the club, like Darren has said, is to win championships and be in it cut off. Sorry. Um, (laughs) I'll get the rest of it in a second, Shiva. Uh, I known in the global market, make the playoffs year after year, essentially becoming a big club. 100%. 100%. I agree with the the overriding goals to be a big club. Part of being a big club is to win trophies and compete for championships and be known in the global market. Um, I think part of being a big club is providing an excellent fan experience. And I think every big club should strive for bringing the city together because that's your... That's your fallback. If you are just a big club that has no community engagement, no community identity, when you have that down year, it's going to fall faster. If you are a big club that has that connection to the community, people are going to be willing to roll with you even when you have that down year. I think that's a big difference. That's what big clubs do when they they sustain it, even through some down years. They've built the community side of it really well. No doubt. And, you know, when you start something from the ground up and you build community as your first step, I mean, even a couple seasons before Atlanta United came online, it was pub diplomacy. It was block by block. It was street by street. And you see in subdivisions and and parts of of the city of Atlanta, you'll go down and you'll see more Atlanta United flags hanging from stoops, from front stoops, than you will uh, the combined other groups that you're thinking of that you would want to hang a flag out for. So all of the steps have been right. They have. It's been successful. Um, They've established an identity quickly. Now they have to sustain it and keep adding to it because it has to evolve. It can't just be static. Let's take a break here. We'll come back. We'll talk about some of the news and notes around the league. We'll talk NWSL as well right after this. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. My 
adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two, Soccer Down Here, Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. Jason Longshore, John Nelson with you this morning. Let's get into the National Women's Soccer League and some of the next steps. Uh, our buddy Mitch Northam, who's going to join us on Thursday at 1030, he had some interesting articles over at Pro Soccer USA. He had two. Um, the one that I think a lot of people grabbed onto immediately was regarding Atlanta. And he had a chance to speak to president of the NWSL, Amanda Duffy, in Cary, North Carolina this weekend. Amanda was on hand for the opener for North Carolina Courage and the Chicago Red Stars, 1-1 draw for the defending champs. But her quote about Atlanta was interesting to me because of how it was framed. So regarding Atlanta and joining the league, this is a direct quote from Mitch's article at Pro Soccer USA. We certainly don't have a question of ownership capabilities or facilities and resources there. But there is a timing and there are priorities that every organization have. And so this is a commitment, too, for any expansion team that's looking at NWSL. So the timing has to be right for anyone that is considering it. How do you take that quote, John? I take that quote as to the NWSL having a pretty decent idea as to who said owners should be and not having any concerns as to the interest of said owner and just trying to figure out one element i don't sure. think it is an element of who said owner should be i think it's a, an element of who said owner would be i think it's past True. that it, it's not even yeah. a case it's not even a question of we hope it's a question of it sounds like we've yeah talked. we're fairly yeah we're fairly and, confident right I, it sounds very confident it's just about when and that's that's the way I read it. Now, that doesn't mean it happens because things fall through all the time. We know this. But it sounds like the uh, the days of the Atlanta vibe and, and that group bringing in WSL to Atlanta, are, it's not happening. Because these quest, this comment would not refer to that group, period. No. This comment would refer to Atlanta United. It's kind yep. of obvious. So... I think if you're a, a, a women's professional soccer fan and you want to see Atlanta have a team and you want it to be attached to Atlanta United, you take this quote with a lot of positivity. Now, there's no timeline. There's no no idea of when it would happen. Um, there absolutely is a timing component to it, and there's priorities that organizations have, 100%. But if you're hoping to see NWSL in Atlanta, this should be a positive statement. Now, bigger picture for the NWSL there's some interesting things that are being worked through. And we talked about some of it with Jonathan Tannewald on the Women's Soccer Weekly NWSL preview last Friday. Amanda told Mitch and, and other reporters who were there at Cary that the, the partnership with A&E Networks, Lifetime TV, when it dissolved, that was unexpected. And that's thrown a lot of things out of whack right now. You know, it's it's been obvious if you follow, you know, the, the soccer community on social media that you've seen people from the NWSL office leave in the last week, last two weeks, just really crazy and weird right before the season starts and a really bad spot for the league. But Jonathan talked about it on on our show. Amanda hinted at it and, and she can't go into detail because of her role, but you know, you're having to dissolve essentially the NWSL media component that was doing a lot of this communications work that was based in New York, that was part of the partnership with A&E, 
that's going away and it's going back to Chicago where the league offices are because U.S. soccer is, is running the league as a management, as you know, a management component, as an administrator. So now you're going away from being split in Chicago and New York to getting rid of the New York side of it and moving everything to Chicago. That's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And it's a very difficult process on the eve of the season starting. So that's been a huge challenge that, as, as Amanda said, wasn't expected. And I don't know the details about the, the breakdown with A&E and Lifetime. There were comments right afterwards that this was a good thing for the league and it wouldn't, they wouldn't be held back by anything and they could move forward. So, John, maybe it's just a matter of getting through the bumpy part of, of that relationship breaking down before we start to see that progress going forward. But that's, I think, a big thing to look for in 2019 with the NWSL. Yeah, and you know we, we know about the relationship with Yahoo Sports. And you, know, you and I have gone through our concerns here leading into the season, uh, even as something as, as simple as, as your, your number one branding opportunity the, in the website and how you're going to get word out, how you're going to get all your information out. So once the league gets through this, this rough patch and hopefully gets everything squared away, you'll, you'll see the, the media component get some steady legs and figure out, okay, here's, here's how we can best address the season. Here's how we can best look at the, uh, the opportunities that we have as a, as a league to, to figure out how best we can put things forward. Speaking of TV, um, Amanda did mention this about the latter half of 2019. It said, we're in some latter stage conversations with some broadcast opportunities for the second half of the season. Then separately, we'll engage on our future broadcast arrangement shortly after we have everything for 2019 in place. The comments about A&E, it may, that all makes total sense. If you were planning on Lifetime... And that came out of nowhere and hit you, what, in February. I'm sure the discussion probably started a little bit before that, but that doesn't sound like by much. You're scrambling, and you're figuring things out. I think the Yahoo thing, I believe, was in place. I think that was going to replace Go90 always, but you expected to have a Game of the Week component, and right now you don't. So hopefully you're able to, to combine the two conversations, and you basically like start a new broadcast arrangement for 2020 and beyond just a few months early and you get some games from 2019 on as a bonus that'd be the way that i'd look at it if if it's let's say fox let's just throw them out there as okay you're going to work out a deal with with fox to be on fs1 for a game of the week or fs2 for a game of the week and all right that's going to start in 2020 but here you go fox you can have three games of the week plus the postseason plus the championship match this year cool done do it whatever it's going to take and i think for the nwsl it is very important because the the lifetime idea was a good idea it was outside the box you had somebody willing to put money into the league you took that at a time where you needed it it didn't pay off i don't think fans you know went to lifetime to watch these games on a regular basis in large enough numbers and they didn't stick around for other lifetime programming so lifetime wasn't happy about it it just it didn't work. It was a good idea. It just didn't work. I think they need to be on traditional sports television. Um, what that looks like and who that partner is and what kind of money we're talking about, those are the things that are difficult to say. And, you know, I think that to, to the point that you just made, I think that getting on late in the year, if not by the beginning of the playoffs, is going to be crucial for the league, especially because we've talked about momentum and we've talked about the, the kind of momentum that you want to build going into a world cup. And you're not going to have that momentum from a, a, a television sense. Now you're not going to have those, those eyes that are going to be looking at the, the product that you want to put out there before a world competition. So now what you're having to do is get everything squared away so you can be there after it and get whatever momentum that you think you can get after the World Cup to get you into 2020 
and sit there and say, okay, here's, you know, you saw the world's best in the World Cup. Here's what we have here to offer with the NWSL. So let's all get together and, you know, get through the nine, get through the 19 season and get into the 20 season. Uh, in 2017, average NWSL viewership on Lifetime was about 93,000 households over the 22 broadcast. It's not good enough. It's, it's just not good enough. Um, I, I think it, it became a situation for Lifetime where that was worse than what other programming that was probably coming at a cheaper cost would get you. And you know, there's just there's no way going forward with that. I think it's even beyond that. You know, it, it kind of gets us back to the conversations about the value for a USL of being on ESPN Plus. Because if you're a soccer fan and you have ESPN Plus for Major League Soccer, for the championship in England, for Serie A, and you see, hey, New Mexico United's on. What? Okay. Let me watch that. Ah, wow, it's pretty good. Cool. I'm in. Right now, at Yahoo, you don't really have that. Like it, you have to go find it as opposed to stumbling on it from other soccer content. I think they'd be in a better position if they were on ESPN Plus right now. Um, they're not. And don't know if that's a possibility. That would, to me, be a very appealing part of a partnership with ESPN if you can pull that off. If you get basically you know, where MLS is. If you get the situation of having a national game of the week, your playoffs, your championship on ESPN or ESPN2 or in the family of ESPN Networks. And the rest of your games are on ESPN+. Plus. I think that'd be a great situation from brand awareness for the NWSL if you can pull it off. There was talk once the the, the deal with uh, A&E and Lifetime went down uh, that NBCSN would be in, an interested party in all of this because of what they've done with the Premier League. And it might Very lead to some other... Uh, cross promotion in and around the NBCSN properties. So would NBCSN be willing to, to add the NWSL to their soccer footprint and to their sports footprint with everything that they have right now? And, you know, for them to do it, you know, you put them, it would, it would probably not be a part of the gold package, even though they may try to do something like that in 2020. Um, Full disclosure, I have the gold package, but I only have it for the Premier League. It would be an interesting look, but I would also want to see how the, the tentacles of the deal would work for the NWSL across all of the the other NBC SN properties and NBC Sports and all that kind of stuff. Do you put it do you put the championship game on NBC? Do you put the championship game on NBC SN? Do you put the league package on gold? Do you put it in as, as a, a diminished rate in 2020 just to draw eyeballs, kind of like what ESPN is doing with Plus? Personally, I think that ESPN would be a better partner just because of all of the, the verticals that are there. But I think if NBCSN wanted to take that kind of a plunge, it, it would be an interesting dynamic to see how NBC Sports would want to play with the NWSL and put it in their verticals and try to grow them. Yeah, I, I think... The WNBA has benefited from being in the ESPN properties, and I think the NWSL would like to get to that level, and it would be worth it. And that's something, I think, where you start talking about dollars either brought to you or partnerships created or what have you that you do have to factor in the awareness instead of just a straight deal. It's going to be interesting for NWSL. Um, then you start to look at, okay, what were the things that helped MLS on TV grow? Expansion and being in some big markets. Right now, there's some big markets that NWSL doesn't touch. Um, Los Angeles being the one that Mia Hamm has talked about quite a bit, bringing NWSL to. Sounds like they were very close to doing something with Barcelona, but couldn't get the partnership worked out. Barca wanted their branding on it. LAFC, I'm sure, wanted their branding or something similar on it. And it didn't happen. That's a must. And that's a big part of you know expansion, as we've talked about being so important for the league. It has to be a more appealing TV property. So you need to get your Los Angeleses, your Atlantas, your maybe a Miami, your big markets involved. And the ones that are in, 
you need to get them more engaged. A Chicago, you know, a Sky Blues in New Jersey, but they have no affiliation to the New York market. Now, that was something that, that Jonathan mentioned on, on Women's Soccer Weekly that was dead on. If NYCFC and City Football Group bought Sky Blue and brought oh. it under the umbrella, your branding's already good. You keep the name. You, you keep rolling with it. You City Football Group has obviously invested heavily in women's soccer in Manchester. Yep. Um, it would benefit the NYCFC brand to have that part of it. Now, there is complication because NWSL is Nike, MLS is Adidas. That, that, that makes things a little hard at times, and that's why you see some of the separation that you do, a Portland Timbers, a Portland Thorns, stuff like that. But in this case, if you are NYC and you're trying to build a stadium, and I, I thought Jonathan just absolutely nailed this in our conversation. If you're trying to build a stadium and you're having problems doing it and you're going to need some help from the city to get this thing done because it's not easy to do, hey, we're adding a professional women's team to the to the equation and they're going to play in the stadium as well. Yeah. It's only going to help you. It's only going to help push these things through. Um, I think that's a no-brainer for everybody concerned because I don't think it would be very expensive to buy Sky Blue, take them on. They would immediately have access to things that they don't have right now that club could be a powerhouse straight away straight away for far less investment than city football groups put into manchester city's women straight away you've got something going those are the things that nwsl has to consider and i mean let's let's go back to our our first hour conversation about identity the nwsl and its clubs the portland thorns have an absolute identity and they've done a great job with it the Red Stars, I think, do a pretty good job with their... They do a better job than the Fire in terms of identity yep. and branding. Easily. It's not just because they have a cool kit that they just did. It's just they seem to get Chicago and what Chicago is all about better than the Fire do. Um, the Pride, the Dash, Orlando and Houston, they're kind of struggling to, to find that identity. Um, Orlando's been interesting because I can't figure out why a team with you know in a city like Orlando that has a great fan base that has supported Orlando City through thick and thin why Alex Morgan, Marta, Sydney LaRue, why that hasn't changed the dynamic of getting butts in the seats. You would think that it would. It hasn't. They haven't been great either. They haven't been good on the field and that does have a factor in this as we talked about, but um that one's a surprising one to me. North Carolina, you have a history of women's soccer. They have an identity, and on the field they have an identity. They don't have superstars. That's Paul Riley style. Um, they have a very balanced, very good team. Portland has superstars. Rain FC, now I think them going to Tacoma, they get a chance to kind of redefine who they are a bit. Sky Blue, we've, we've talked about so many times. They, they've got to figure something out. Utah, they have that identity with Rail Salt Lake. The things that, that are benefits for Real Salt Lake carry over to Utah Royals. It's been good so far. You're you know going into year two, so we have to see, obviously. But it's the same challenges. It's the same challenges that MLS teams have. You, you have clubs that need to either sharpen their identity or define their identity in NWSL, and it's a necessary factor in the league's success going forward. I think the biggest thing is just getting back on solid ground right now after the partnership with A&E dissolved. Yeah. And I love the idea about city football group diving in and rolling sky blue into their footprint and getting that as something to sit there and wave at the city of, uh, and wave at the city of New York and sit there in whatever borough and go, look, you know, here's what we've got. Um, yeah. I mean, I want to see now, once we're past World Cup, I want to see the steps that the NWSL is going to take in putting their product in some kind of visible manner. What the network partnership is, who it's with, is it Fox, is it ESPN, you know, is it NBCSN as, as that wild card? And figure out, okay, how do we go forward from here. I would have liked to have seen some steps going into the world cup. I would have liked to have seen some steps 
coming into this season about adding some teams. But I just don't want the NWSL to, to be reactive continually when it comes to trying to figure out how to make things better for all the eyeballs and better for the sport here in the U.S. I'd like to see some proactive ideas first and foremost and then going from there. Maybe the A&E partnership dissolving is what stopped that from happening. Um, it would make sense, and it would follow along with some of the lines out of NWSL that the partnership was why they couldn't grow, they couldn't expand, they wanted to expand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it with a clean slate now. Now that we know, okay, this was a bumpy, bumpy dissolution of the partnership. It, it didn't go the way anybody expected it would. It happened at a time nobody expected it would. Okay. Now you're starting over. You're kind of in that Columbus Crew situation where, okay, league's still going. You get a chance to redefine who you are. You have a World Cup coming up. Hopefully you get a bump out of that. You can you can play off of that. But now you got to hit the ground running. And I'm curious to see what the first moves are to start running. What comes out of the blocks? What's that first step look like? That's what I want to see now from the NWSL. Um, week two uh, starts tomorrow, actually, with North Carolina Courage. And as I said, Mitch Northam from Pro Soccer USA will be on the show with us Thursday. He'll be on hand for the Courage's match tomorrow night. We'll talk to him about that. We'll look around the NWSL on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. We're going to take a break. We'll get into more of your Tuesday thoughts right after this. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience supporters of atlanta united faction and inter atlanta youth football club if you've been hurt in a wreck contact steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24 7 at 404-377-9191 the initial consultation is free A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. 6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back. Soccer down here. April 16th, Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. Some news and notes around MLS. Uh, We just retweeted Gabe Gabor, who works with the league on a a number of different things, um, specifically Latin media, um, Spanish language media based out of Miami tweeted uh, something from NBC Sports. Major League Soccer has the eighth best average attendance for all soccer leagues over the past five years. Atlanta United is the 10th best supported team in the world. Seattle Sounders, 29th best supported club in the world. Crazy to think that Mm -hmm. Atlanta United is the 10th best supported club in the world. Hey, it's two years. And we will see how it goes over time. Will it increase? Will it decrease? Some people keep saying they think it's going to decrease. They think, like we talked about with identity, if the wins aren't there, do things decrease? I think there's room to grow. That That's me. I'm also a glass half full kind of guy. 
That's that's how I look at things generally. I think there's a lot of room to grow. But if no, the I, results yeah. aren't there for a club that has defined itself as a big club, part of being a big club is lifting trophies. You have to do it. It has to be part of it. Now, I don't think a one-year blip is going to drop the attendance, but you don't win a trophy in five? Yeah, you start to see an effect, for sure. That's that's how sports fans are. You want to be part of a winning product. I mean, let's let's go back to Sunday and Tiger Woods. Everybody, and I mean, very few exceptions, because they were out there, of course. You have your contrarians who want to argue about everything. But everybody wants to be part of greatness. Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer of this generation, and he hadn't been for quite a while. He was this weekend. He wins another major, and everybody enjoyed it, was part of it, was moved by it. That's sports. And if you're in a a market like Atlanta that has said, we are going to give you that. That is what we are going to do. Seattle does that too. Toronto does that too. LA Galaxy do that too. LAFC has branded themselves that way. We are going to give you the best. You have to bring the best. <laughs> That's just how it is. Yeah, I, I mean, it's you. You look at if you you don't want to you don't want to write checks with your mouth that your body can't cash, and especially in, in today's economic environment, you don't want to do that kind of stuff. And so far, Atlanta United's backed it up. And now that you're in that period of transition, how do you continue to adjust and back it up? And, and it's not just Atlanta United. It's any team that sits there and puts, you know, and sticks their chin out and sits there and says, okay, this is what we want to do. But, but yeah, but I mean, if you're not, if sports is yeah. you have to write checks that your mouth can't cash because you can't guarantee winning. Nobody can. It's impossible. You can't control winning unless you're trying to do it through the referees, and we saw what happened to uh, Italy when that happened. That's different. You or can't Tim Donaghy. Well, that's, no team was doing that. That's what I'm saying. Like Atlanta United can say, we're going to give you trophies. We're going to buy the best players. We're going to give you the best product. That's our goal. They can't guarantee it. No club expected Leicester to win the Premier League the year that they did. It happens sometimes. You can't control injuries. You can't control loss of form. You can't control things completely in sports. If you were a network who put money into broadcasting golf and you did it in 2008, you're doing that off of what Tiger had won the U.S. Open in 2008. Yeah. He was still at the top of his game. You're like, all right, we're going to lock this up because, man, the ratings are good. Everything's hot. Let's do it. Here's a fat check to the PGA Tour. Oh, no. What just happened? You couldn't control what happened to to Tiger off the course. You couldn't control his back injuries. You couldn't control any of that. If you're a team, you can't control these things. You can say, we're going to do this. We're going to strive for this. And you have to keep striving for it. But you can't control the outcomes. That's why we love this. Because you do get a year where the Houston Dynamo come out of nowhere and get to the Western Conference Finals and are a game away from going to MLS Cup Final, and they would have had every chance to win that year. They're not telling their fans that we're going to win trophies every year. They don't have the money to say that. They have to look at things differently. They have to define their identity differently. They haven't done a great job of defining that identity. That's something on them. But clubs that say we're going to win everything and we're going to try to win everything every year, you still can't guarantee it. You have to write those checks that you can't guarantee get cashed because that's how you sell it. And that's how you get people in the seats. But then how many, how many times, how many times does a fan sit there and say, okay, you've told me this, you've told me this, you've told me this and nothing's happened. And then they disengage the Braves. I mean, the Braves were the prime example because they hit a level of excellence, but not the level of excellence. And they stagnated. Um, you see it with any other club. I mean, 
the Cubs have a history that they could always rely on, and they were always going to be better than your average team in terms of attendance and identity and, and who they are and interest. But, yeah, when they started winning, what happened? <laughs> I mean, you saw ratings through the roof. Everything changed. It got bigger. But people did disengage a little bit because they didn't expect the Cubs to be a successful team. The Red Sox went through that at times. The Yankees have been through that at times. It happens to big clubs where you have down eras. Real Madrid. I mean, you're, what, what was one of the big conversations around Real Madrid this year? Coming off of three straight Champions Leagues, uh, the attendance was dropping because people didn't like what they were seeing. We got to make a change now. It can happen to the biggest. Um, it's just so hard to, to do it. It's so hard to get everything right. And you can't. I think it's almost impossible to sustain that level of excellence forever. You want your down periods to be short. You want your your up periods, your your golden eras to be long. And when one dies out, you want to get to the second one very quickly. Um, some more information. Yeah, well, anybody. I mean, that's that's anybody. That's that's you know Alabama when Nick Saban gets bored and leaves Alabama football. Are they going to be able to sustain this, or is it going to dip? How long does it dip? That these are the things that you know. That's why sports are what they are. That's why sports TV, you know, dollars that are out there are massive because it is the greatest drama you can have. It's unpredictable. You don't know. You think you know. You don't know. You never know how it's going to go. Sometimes it goes the way you thought it might. Other times you get into a complete surprise. It is just live drama. And you have, in the United States, you have a bunch of different avenues for it with football, with basketball, with baseball, with soccer, with hockey. I mean, right now, the, the Stanley Cup playoffs are getting everybody's attention. Ovechkin's knocking people out. I mean, it's chaos. Um, yes. Let's dig a little deeper into the NBC Sports article uh, before we take a break. So, Major League Soccer and Liga MX um, were both praised for their growth. Average attendance, Bundesliga and Premier League lead the way. 43,000 in the Bundesliga, 36.6 in the Premier League. La Liga's next, 27,000 average, third in the world. Mexico's Liga MX, fourth best average attendance in the world, 25,582. MLS has seen the second highest growth rate in attendance figures from 2003 to 2018 with only attendances in Poland growing at a rate quicker than that. That's interesting. I would have never guessed that one. Poland? Um, yeah. The Polish first division grew at a quicker rate. I don't. It's not higher than MLS, but the rate of growth from 03 to 18 has been bigger. Um, the report concludes that Mexico's Liga MX is the best league in the world for attendances outside of Europe, while the U.S., Canada, and China are showing strong levels of growth. Um, this is a quote. Outside of Europe, Mexican clubs attract the biggest crowds. The study of the changes since 2003 reveals the growing enthusiasm for football in the United States and Canada. Despite the increase in the number of teams participating in the MLS, average attendances have consistently increased to break the 20,000 spectator threshold over the past five years. The limit has also been broken in China, where football's popularity is henceforth well-established, too. It's impressive. Um, Borussia Dortmund lead the way for individual teams at 80,000 plus for average attendance. Manchester United 75 to 18, Barcelona 74 876. Um, the clubs that are ahead of Atlanta United in average attendance in the world: Dortmund, Manchester United, Barcelona, Bayern Munich 73 7, Real Madrid 69 8, Schalke 61 3, Arsenal 59 7, Hamburg 52 3. Stuttgart, 52,012. Atlanta's at 51,547. Barely ahead of uh, Mönchengladbach at 51,3. Manchester City, 50,864. Newcastle, 50,721. Benfica at number 14 is the last one that's over 50,000 at 50,077. Interesting stuff. Um, can you sustain it? Can you continue to grow? Poland grew at 47% from 2003 to 2018. Wow. Yeah. Um, MLS USA, uh, 34% growth from 2003 to 2018. Poland grew from an average attendance of 
6,100 between 2003 and 2008 to just under 9,000 from 2013 to 2018. U.S. and MLS went from 15.9 to 21.3 over that same period of time. I mean, you, you you look at what you're seeing, but I mean, but still, I mean, I, you look at the Poland number, you're going 6,000 to 9,000, good on you. But I, I think the, the Atlanta United numbers, for me, that that's, you know, having seen it, over the last five years, get to this point. I mean, there's a there's a lot to be proud of if you're in that organization, but there's also a lot of work to do in the organization to keep that up and to maintain what we've seen, both on the field and off. So, the engagement continues to be there. The promotion continues to be there. The what what we see from their social media department continues to push the product out there and make sure that everybody gets to see it. So there's uh, it, you can sit there and probably pat yourself on the back for about 30 seconds, but then that means there's that much more work to do. It's got to keep growing. And, and as, as people have said on Twitter and will continue to say, there is a difference between tickets distributed and butts and seats. There's a difference between tickets purchased and tickets distributed. These things are very true, 100%. Um, tickets purchased and butts and seats, I don't have as big of an issue because if the money's in the coffers, the money's in the coffers. Yeah. When tickets are being distributed and handed out and not used, that's a huge problem. That's a bigger issue to deal with. We don't know those breakdowns. Um, we do know that, yes, Atlanta United's difference between – in the building, through the turnstiles and the announced numbers that came out through the AJC and Georgia World Congress Center, there were some differences. Not big differences, but there were some differences. And there's definitely some things that can account for that. You have people who come in uh, different ways, different you know, tickets that are given away. Some of the sweet stuff is a little different. There's things that happen to account for some of it. But I'd love to know how that works in other countries, too, because I don't. I've seen attendances announced in other countries, and I'm like, whoa, okay, I didn't think that, but all right, cool. Yes. It happens. It's part of the deal. It's part of the, the game that is played in all of this. So you do need better attendances in some markets in this league, for sure. It has to grow. The overall growth, you can't deny that it's so much better than it was in 2003 and 2005 and 2007 and 2010 and 2011. The league is continuing to grow, and it's a big deal, and I don't see that stopping right now. That doesn't mean that Chicago doesn't need to get better. That doesn't mean the Red Bulls don't need to get better. That doesn't mean that Montreal needs to get better. It doesn't mean that you know clubs can just be happy where they are. You have to continue to look to grow because there is definitely not a low ceiling on it, in my opinion. Let's take a break. Get back into your Tuesday thoughts. If you guys have them, tweet at us, at soccer down here. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. 
This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Soccer Down here. Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. Love to hear your thoughts on identity of clubs around the league, of the reports on global soccer attendance that we just discussed in the last segment. Um, Tafka is on a roll about the attendance, and I'm pulling up the whole roll now. Don't want to disjoint the roll. I don't. The roll's not finished yet. Tafka says, when thinking about Atlanta United's attendance, my first thought is that we hit 50,000 average and we have a huge waiting list for season tickets. I'm wondering if the club will give some sort of wait list half measure to reward fans who have waited years for season tickets. I think, and I, I don't know the process, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when they open the full stadium, that's one thing they do that the people who are on the waiting list get to like stay involved. Uh, Seattle's doing that this year. They announced that they'll be opening the stadium for four games fully. They haven't done that since 2016. You know, it's something that I think people took for granted when it came to Seattle, but they didn't do it the last two seasons. They're opening up the full stadium for Portland, for Vancouver, for the LA Galaxy, and for Minnesota on decision day. It's the first time they've done that in a while. I would say that Atlanta's success has had a hand in that. I don't think there's really another big reason other than just you know sheer interest in Seattle um, which is great but I think it was there before I was a little surprised they didn't do it over the last couple of years what was the number that you gave me yesterday about over the last 25 matches what Seattle's been able to do um win a lot and they're on like 22 and three or something like that something like that I think 20 three and two or 22 and three um basically they'd be on a pace to have 71 points in a season off what they've done um but that's really your that's last season and the start of this season and maybe a couple of games uh, at the end of 2017 so to not to decide at the beginning of 2017 to say we're not going to open the whole stadium um coming off of a championship and then in 2018 coming off of a back-to-back MLS cup appearances to say, we're not going to do that a little surprising, but they're doing it now and we'll see if that continues to push Seattle back. I, I wonder what the cost effectiveness is for Seattle and, and what that looks like. Um, if that had a hand in it, if they decided, well, we're yeah. not getting the number of tickets and the number of the amount of revenue in to justify the cost of opening up the full venue. Yeah, um, that would be that to me, that would be something that I would be looking at. And, you know, is it because it's something that a lot of venues who are taking those steps, they look into is, is the, is it cost effective to open up the full barn? And then you sit there and, okay, you don't sell the thing out and then you have a bunch of empty seats and you have a bunch of folks who you've brought on that day who aren't doing anything. And uh, you're, you know, we talk about ROI a lot, but uh, return on investment, cost effectiveness that, you know, that definitely should go, be going into it. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it has to. Um, some other nuggets around the league. Taylor Twelman on Extra Time said, keep an eye on Robert Lewandowski and MLS. Where would he end up in Major League Soccer, Yikes. in your opinion? Huh. Who needs Lewandowski right now? Who would say no to Lewandowski is maybe the better well, question. Yeah. I mean, anybody who – I mean, could you see Lewandowski in Chicago? Yeah. Uh, could you see him um, selling more shirts in Chicago than anybody outside of Cuauhtémoc Blanco ever has? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that'd be massive. And the rumors, remember earlier this year, 
there were rumors that the Fire were shopping Nemanja Nikolic. If you trade Nemanja Nikolic and add Lewandowski, done. Yeah. And you move back to Soldier Field, done. You're good. Mm-hmm. You fixed everything. All is well in Chicago Fireland. And, you know, I mean, think think about Lewandowski and, uh, and Basti with that... I mean, if you that PR machine that you hopefully pounce on, if that goes down, it's a lot better than Iker Casillas coming into town. That's so much better. It's not even close. Like that's that's Fernando one of those. Torres. That, yeah, but those are the kind of moves that it's like you know. Well, yeah, he's a big name, but is he a big name that's actually going to move the needle? Probably not. And I think sometimes clubs get blinded by well, he's a big name in Europe. That doesn't necessarily translate to your average fan. And it's something that it's been an ongoing conversation. As a lot of, you know, about soccer media, um, you've had some freelance writers cut back on the athletic. Um, they just hired five national writers. And one of them is our good friend, Felipe Cardenas, uh, Felicidades mm-hmm. to Felipe. Um, you're going to see more coverage of the league from Felipe. Uh, I believe Paul Tenorio said one of the pieces he wants to unleash Felipe on is a profile of Albert Ellis in Houston, which I Sweet. love to read. Love to read. Um, I think one of the issues that soccer media has at times, and I've seen this echoed throughout some of these conversations, and I don't know if people are realizing it, is that sometimes it's an echo chamber. Sometimes it is soccer people talking to soccer people and maybe the amount of soccer people who are there to support these teams is not quite as big as you think. I think that's one of the things about Atlanta and one of the secret stories about Atlanta that doesn't get talked about around the country as much is I would be willing to bet, and I'm not a huge betting man, so I'm not putting a whole lot of money on this, but I'd be willing to bet that if you did a survey of Atlanta United regular attendees, whether you're season ticket holders or you buy tickets on a regular basis, you, you go to half the games in a year. And you did the survey of, of people who are in that situation in Atlanta, and you did it for other markets in the league. I think you would find that the percentage of those folks who are at Atlanta United matches on a regular basis, even people who don't go to the matches on a regular basis but consume the product on a regular basis, whether they listen on radio, watch on TV, what have you. People who are engaged with the product. I'd say that the overall percentage of people who are engaged with Atlanta United's product who would not have identified as a soccer fan five years ago is higher than anywhere else in the country. And I think part of the reason for that is the coverage of the soccer media, of Dirty South Soccer, of all the podcasts, but also of having a beat writer at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution like Doug Robertson, of yep. having 92.9 The Game talk about it on a regular basis, of having mainstream media, mainstream primetime news talking about it on a regular basis. I think the effect of that is just not talked about enough. I think Atlanta has grown the soccer market in Atlanta United has grown the soccer market in Atlanta more than any other team in their domestic, their local market. And that's a huge part of it because if, if you are soccer media, just talking to soccer fans, it's very, it's slow growth. It will grow. Exclusive. It's not ex- it doesn't need to be exclusive and it doesn't That's have what I'm to saying. Be. But I think there's a lot of soccer media that is not exclusive and is is not meant to be exclusive. I just don't think the outreach is there to go past it. I think there is soccer media that is exclusive. Yes, I think there is soccer media that has a a feel of being exclusive and insider. And look, there's a market for that. Don't get me wrong. Like I that's that's not a bad thing because you have that in the NBA. You have that in Major League Baseball. You have that in football. I think to a lesser extent in football. But you definitely have that in, in Major League Baseball with a lot of the what the, the new statistics and that discussion about baseball. Look, I'm lost. I, I grew up on baseball. When people get into some of those conversations, I have no idea yeah. what language they're speaking. Yeah, and war I to feel me left is... Out. Yeah. 
Well, I get the the concept of it, but then going past it to where I can actually like have a conversation about all of the advanced statistics in baseball, I I, I can't contribute. I'm I'm lost. I, I feel left out. I switch off. Um, there's elements of that in basketball too that I feel switched off. But then there's elements of of basketball, you know, coverage. I think NBA TV, you know, a, a show like The Starters does a pretty good yeah. job of balancing it. And when I've been really engaged in the NBA, that's one that I've turned to that I, f- I feel like has opened a door to that for me. Where it's like, okay, I, I, when they get into some of those conversations, cool, they, they put it in a way that I can understand, I, I get it, and I'm, I feel like I'm part of it. They also have fun with things, and, and they're not afraid to have fun with the sport. I think sometimes we don't get enough of that in, in American soccer coverage. And I, I hope we get to that point, and I hope that you know, the athletic continues to invest. I hope that others do. You know, we've had others in the past that have invested and it hasn't been sustainable because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It is a business. We all know that there are people who, you know, the stories of, of writers like Matt Pence, who, you know, we've had on the show before who lost his beat in Seattle in a huge market for soccer. Uh, they, they dropped Matt Pence and he's freelanced and he's, you know, grinded and grinded and grinded to keep doing what he's doing. And he's had to take on other jobs to do that. And he's found success. And now he's on with full time with the athletic. It's a business. And if the business is not sustainable in some markets, it, it's going to, it's going to decrease. But I think one way that it becomes more sustainable is to th- rethink how you present the coverage and think about how you engage with your market and your community. I think that's a very vital piece of it. I think it's something that Atlanta has done a very good job of. And I hope that other markets do. And I hope that people who are thinking about investing in soccer media consider that. It has to grow past your hardcore of the hardcore soccer fans. Otherwise, it's not going to grow very fast. It'll grow because the game is constantly growing in the United States but it'll grow at a slower rate. I think if you want it to grow faster and be sustainable, you got to put in the hard work of growing the fan base. That's an element that, I mean, you can go back to professional sports coming to Atlanta in the late sixties. And if you were a writer for the Atlanta journal or the Atlanta constitution at that time, and you wanted to have a career at being a sports writer, you had to play a role in growing the fan base for the Braves, for the Falcons when they started 1966, when the Hawks came to town, when the Atlanta Chiefs came to town. There was an element of that. It's the same now for soccer. And we'll see how it continues to grow. It's a very interesting time, but I hope that other markets and other outlets look at some of the things that have happened here about creating new soccer fans. That's a good thing, and, and I hope that that is something that others look at doing more and more because I think it needs to happen in some of the the big markets around the country that it's just not happening in. Let's take our final break. Thoughts on that? Thoughts on anything else on a Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show on Twitter, at Soccer Down Here. Hit us up now. It's your last call. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apple and Associates personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience supporters of atlanta united faction and inter atlanta youth football club if you've been hurt in a wreck contact steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24 7 at 404-377-9191 the initial consultation is free A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. 
Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back. Soccer down here, final segment, Tuesday Thoughts, April 16th. What do you think, John, about the idea of media playing, I mean, a bit of a dual role? Like, there is covering the game, covering the stories, all of that, but also growing the game. Mm -hmm. Should they do that? Should that even be part of the, I mean, is that part of the deal? I think so especially when you're trying to because if you're out there and you share information that's part of it but if these days you're trying to expand viewer base listener base reader base then if part of it is the educational aspect of it if if it, you're doing things other than just giving x's and o's and sound bites and quotes uh, that I think that, yeah, I think these days it is part of it, especially if you're you're looking out for the long-term viability of your product, no matter where it is. So I think that when you are when you want to do something, you want to bring people along for the ride, and you're always going to have that. You're always going to have your core audience, no matter what you do. But if you want to expand your core audience, figure out how to do that, and if it's doing all of these ancillary things, then that should help that should help you expand your base. It should help expand the education of the product and it should also expand what the sport is looking to accomplish, no matter what the sport is, I would think. I mean, I think if you want to grow the sustainability of your business model, there there's an element to that because the the numbers are there. I mean 442 came into the market, created a U.S. component, and invested money into it, and it wasn't sustainable. It didn't grow their business enough to keep it going. Copa 90 did the same. They invested in staff and invested in in infrastructure to have a Copa 90 U.S., and they've pulled back on that. There's enough history now of doing it that way, and is that going to work? you have to question no. So, okay, what do you do? I think you do have to grow it. And I think in Atlanta, you've seen people, you know, at the AJC and sports talk radio and, and other local you know media outlets say that, Hey, there's an opportunity here. We're going to jump on board. And yeah, there, there's a bit of, okay, a bit of education, a bit of explanation, a bit of, you know, putting in the time to grow something. Cool. We think it's going to pay off and we're going to leverage, you know, our existing resources to do that. I think it's worked for, for quite a few. It's something that needs to continue to happen. I mean, I can I can speak to the fact because the numbers are are you know public out there, they're published, that ninety two nine the games ratings have gone up. Their ratings have gone up uh year to year, their ratings have gone up month to month, and the biggest difference is is soccer on the radio and soccer conversation on the radio. That's a good thing. So they're going to continue to invest because it's paying off. Now, they have a backbone of, yes, they're not soccer specific. They have a backbone of of other sports that are there too. But they're seeing growth, and one of the primary drivers is soccer coverage. That's a good thing. 
So if you're a soccer outlet, I think you do need to realize that there is still an element of growing your market. And I think it's something that the athletic, again, they're not just a soccer outlet. They do have a backbone of other things that are going to drive it. But if the soccer section is going to be big, I think there is a growing the fan base side to it. And I hope that the the full-time writers and editors and, and staff that they have on board understand that there's an element to that. I think Atlanta shows what it can be if it's done correctly. So we'll see. Um, look, there, there's people out there who would tell you these are all fake numbers and this is all doom and gloom and all that. And everything's bad, even though the growth that is out there that was just cited by independent people from Europe about growth of soccer coverage in the United States, soccer attendance in the United States. Uh, people will tell you that it's all a lie. I, I'm going to tell you that it's not. Um, being involved in the game as long as I have watching the general interest from the 2006 World Cup to now watching the general interest in soccer in this city from 1995 until now, it's grown. You can argue numbers. You can argue things all you want. It's grown. Trust me. You're not having problems finding a place to play and playing in a... 4,000 seat high school venue anymore at the top level. <laughs> That's those days are gone. It's not happening anymore. Um, don't get distracted by that stuff. It's just, it's, it's a waste of time. The game is growing. It's a pretty cool time to be involved in the game right now. And it's a pretty cool time to see where it can go because I don't think it's hit a ceiling. I don't think it's, it's going to anytime soon. Uh, Tafka with a, a further, point on his point about the, the waiting list he said i think offering an upper deck season ticket option for one section of the stadium would be a feasible approach i don't because of the way they do the curtains i, I think it's a little more complicated than that basically though we're on the same page like figuring out okay how many sections you have to open to move the curtains or maybe you have to do like one end Maybe you have to do one side, something like that, because of the way the curtains are. You can't just open one section because there's still going to be curtains next to it that are going to block it. So figuring out the the logistics, and that's basically where you're at. Figuring that out, that's probably your next step for growth, I would agree, is, okay, are there enough on the wait list who would buy tickets to do this Um Tofka thinks it's 6,000 on the end line, 10,000 on the touch line. I think it's bigger than that because, well, you've got the two touch lines, so 20, 26, doing math. Yeah, you might be right, Tofka. I think you'd probably start with the end line section. And you'd probably have to move the curtains on like one section on the touch lines so your sight lines aren't messed up. I would probably start there. I don't know how big the wait list is. I don't know. But yeah, that's probably your next step is figuring out, okay, where do you grow it? How do you grow it? How much of a section are you going to jump into? Is it going to be just the end line about 6,000? Is it going to be a touch line at about 10,000? Which one are you ready to do first? I, that's, that's next. I would say that that's next. I don't think they go straight from 45 to opening the whole thing up all the time. I think there is an intermediate step, and that's probably it. To your point, uh, Joe Boss about growing the game said that uh, us in 92.9 The Game is how he got started with Atlanta United hearing your excitement, hearing you and your excitement, so he watched a match. I was instantly addicted, never watched a soccer match in my life until two years ago. I'm really glad that I'm able to express that and, and show that. It's not just me. I mean, you know, it's it's the whole presentation, like... You know, I, I, I do know, and I do definitely take that responsibility very seriously. And I'm just the same as, as the, the guys for the athletic who talked about their stories of, of working other jobs, of, of sacrificing, of figuring out things to do, because this is what they want to do. Same for me. I mean, I've had to be creative in figuring things out to pay my bills and keep going and keep growing it because I believe in it. I think it's only going to grow. And again, I take that responsibility of, 
of growing the game very seriously. I made that decision a, a long time ago. This is the the life I want to have, and this is the impact I want to have, and I'm glad that you know it is happening. I'm glad I I can't tell you enough about how meaningful it is to hear stories like Joe's and others that some way they discovered me talking about it and it had an impact on it. Um, it's very humbling, but it definitely drives me to do more and, and figure out more ways to do it. And I'm not going to be satisfied. And there's not like a, there's not a number that is okay. This is good enough. Like there, there's nothing. It's, I just want it to continue to grow. I want to continue like, introducing it to new people and furthering the fandom of people who've been around for a long time and try to do both because it is, there are multiple streams happening in this fan base on a regular basis. And you have new fans jumping on board every day. You have new kids who are, you know, growing into it and listening and reading and consuming product. You have new parents whose kids have gotten into it at a very young age. And maybe the kids aren't, really driving like listening to radio and and reading everything they can find just yet they're just enjoying playing on the weekend but the parents want to learn more and they're finding it whatever it is whether you're a fan from overseas who are like oh this is a this is this is real this feels legit i want to get in on board cool i i think that there's all elements to that and i want to see it continue to grow and i think it has and i think you want to quibble with numbers fine that's cool and where is it where tr- is it truly? Is it all smoke and mirrors? No, it's not. I, I'm just, I'm not that negative kind of person. I'm not trying to pick holes in every single possible argument and say that something's not good. Look, this is good. We know that. If you're part of it, if you've felt it, if you've been there from day one, if you've been there from day one this year, it's good. It's fun. There's good things about it. There's plenty to talk about. We're going to continue to do that. Plenty of other people are going to do that too. They're going to talk about it. They're going to write about it. It's all good. It's going to continue to grow. There's really nothing to be worried about. So American soccer is in a good place. There's a lot of opportunity for it to grow. Atlanta soccer, as good as it is, there's plenty of opportunities for it to grow. Nobody's going away anytime soon. There's going to be plenty more to talk about. And tomorrow on a Wall Pass Wednesday, we will talk about whatever you guys want to get into. That's what Wall Pass Wednesday is all about. Uh, Mike Conti from 92.9 The Game will join us at 10 o'clock. We already have a question in the barrel from Kevin from Charlotte. We'll, We'll leave it with this, and this might spark some others. And this is always good to hear because... We all have cliches in whatever game we we call, whatever sport we're involved in. There are cliches. Kevin from Charlotte asks this, and this is where we'll leave it today, so you can chime in on Kevin's question. You can ask anything else you'd like to ask along these lines. Kevin says, what are your sports talk pet peeves? My soccer ones are player X is finding joy, and team X is asking a lot of questions. What are your sports talk pet peeves? If we use them, and I'm sure we do, (laughs) because you kind of have to sometimes. I've used Finding Joy before. It's not one of my favorites. It's just so commonly used now. It feels like that's one that popped up in the last like few years. That's a very recent one. The Asking a Lot of Questions one feels like a very British one. Yeah, I've heard it for a long time, but Finding Joy feels like a newer one. Let us know what your sports talk pet peeves are. Ask questions like Kevin from Charlotte. We're here. And I'll try to use all of them in the show tomorrow. Yes. And we will drive you crazy with them. I know Jay Riddle does not like the word talisman and using that one. I love that one. Actually. I use that one a lot. So sorry. I apologize in advance. Anybody. It's not even, that's not a most solid thing. That's been talked about for a long time. I'm just saying Um, that recent examples are, are, uh, you know, you hear that a lot of with Liverpool and most solid being the talisman. He, you hear it a lot for Kevin De Bruyne. You, you hear it a lot for a lot of Frankie De Jong with Ajax. It's it's just a common, it's a very common one. Let us know what you think about that. Any other questions on a Wall Pass Wednesday? Thanks for listening. Thank you for chiming in. Fun conversation about identities around the league and different clubs today. Uh, we couldn't do it without you guys. Uh, coming up the rest of the day on the SDH platform, you will have a twos review about Atlanta United twos. Week that was, six-point week, big week for the club. We'll talk about that. 
myself, John, Jarrett, will chime in on our thoughts. We'll also some audio and highlights from the games. I will also have our USL Championship in 10 later today. Uh, 10 things you need to know about the USL Championship in the last week and looking ahead to the upcoming week in the league. And we'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m. for Wall Pass Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata.